And next we have uh, a young woman who I heard speak at the ballet conference recently, and I had already invited her to speak at this conference, but I was so moved by the way she spoke and what she spoke about, which I'm sure she'll speak about some of it today, that I thought, I am so glad I invited this woman to speak. So this is um, Nikki Silvestri. She is the executive director of Green for All in Oakland. Uh, and this was the organization that Van Jones founded. And I, I do want to mention that Van Jones, who I'm sure everybody here knows who he is, he spoke at our conference 10 years ago at Pacific Grove, and nobody knew who he was. And now everybody knows. So we were kind of on the leading edge then, too. So uh, Nikki is executive director of Green Fall, as I said, an organization working to build a more inclusive, healthy, and sustainable economy. Prior to joining Green for All, she served as executive director of People's Grocery in Oakland, California, where she led efforts to cultivate economic and environmental justice within the food sector. She holds a master's degree in African American Studies from UCLA. Please welcome Nikki Silvestri. Good morning. So I'm going to out myself and say an appreciation because I was that awful speaker that got stuck on the freeway and was terrifying the organizers of this conference because they thought that I wouldn't make it. So I want to have an appreciation for Georgia, an appreciation for Jennifer back there for working with me on that. So food systems is what we just talked about. That's something that's near and dear to my heart. What I wanted to talk a little bit more about today was the intersection of the environment, the economy, people of color, and social justice. So to tell a bit of a story and set some context for what it is that I'm talking about, I wanted to share that um, I attended the DC hearing and the Pittsburgh hearing of the Environmental Protection Agency's carbon emission standards. Everybody, are we familiar with that? A bit. So for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, the Environmental Protection Agency released standards for carbon emissions for coal power plants recently. And considering the fact that carbon is what actually causes the greenhouse gas effect and it's never been regulated, this is pretty monumental. So I attended the hearings because if you wanted to say you're for it, you're against it, the EPA set up four hearings across the country to allow you to offer your feedback. I was the only person of color both days that I attended, the one in DC and the one in Pittsburgh. However, in DC, there was a huge rally. There was a rah, rah, let's get everybody fired up. And at the rallies and at the demonstrations, there were plenty of people of color. We were very well represented. But in the actual democratic process of deciding what we want to put into our lungs, we were absent. So one of the things that I want to talk about is the intersection of inspiration and implementation in movement building and in building our local economies and our national economies. How do the two intersect? How do we get them to work together so that everyone who needs to participate in these processes can? Backing up a bit, I think it helps to put this divide into more personal terms before I start to get into the wonky stuff. So I wanted to tell a bit of a story of who I am as well. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. And I'm an 80s baby, which means that Captain Planet was my thing when I was growing up. Do y'all know about Captain Planet? They're all guys. OK, so just, just, just for a tidbit. Captain Planet, he's a hero. Going to take pollution down to zero. That was the theme song, right? And there was a. It, so Don said he had his two-hour version, his 19-hour version. I can sing that entire theme song with the different voices and everything. So if anybody ever wants to hear that, come to my office. But what was wonderful about Captain Planet was that it was a white kid, a black kid, an Asian kid, and an Indian kid, and like I think one other kid, who would all get together and fight pollution. And when their powers, when they couldn't actually fight polluters because the polluters were cutting down too many trees or something, they would unite their powers and Captain Planet would burst forth and he had, you know, skin like the sky and hair like the earth and Whoopi Goldberg was the voice of the earth. It was bad ass. <laughs> the point being, that's what I thought environmentalism was. 
when I was a kid. A multiracial whole planet get together to fight the polluters so that we can all have a healthy planet. Then I got to school and started talking to people about wanting to be an environmentalist. And what I got back was a bunch of blank stares. My peers said, what are you doing? Black people have things that are way more important than trees and whales and polar bears. Our kids are in jail. Our people are dying. We don't have time for this. And then I had a teacher challenge me to try to figure out what environmentalism was, really. So before there was the internet, I went and did the card catalog thing at my library, and I looked up newsletters from the mainstream environmental organizations and was confronted by a sea of old white guys. And I got the very clear impression that, oh, I got it. Environmentalism is actually not me. That's not a field that I can be in. And that plagued me all the way up to college. There was a part of me that was totally a tree-hugging hippie and a part of me that was in the streets with my people. So I worked with the African Student Union. I worked with the Statewide Environmental Coalition in California. Over here, Statewide Environmental Coalition, I was the only black person for four years straight. Over here in the African Student Union, I was that weirdo who wouldn't flush the toilet and tried to get everybody to eat healthy and had dreadlocks. At one of the African Student Union get-togethers, one of the, the um, they, they gave me a, what do you call them? Plaque. Yeah, a little plaque that said, person most likely to be down for her people while married to a white boy with dreadlocks. Because they all knew who I was, right? <laughs> they knew me, they accepted me for who I was, but I wasn't able to get the intersection right. I was inspiration and implementation fragmented in separate places. I drew inspiration from both of those places and implementation from both of those places, but never the twain met until I got to the Bay Area, which I'm very excited about, right? Van Jones saved me. I saw him speak when he said, this is the speech Al Gore would have given had he been black. I promptly attached myself to his left leg until he agreed to hire me. <laughs> and luckily, he took to stalking well and I was able to work for Green for All during the first year, and now I'm so honored and privileged to be able to come back as its executive director. And I also work to People's Grocery, as Georgia said. And so being up here, I've been able to really see what it's like to be a person of color who is very squarely and leading for the environment. Why is that so important that people of color are leading? when it comes to the environment, particularly the economics of what it takes to be environmentally sustainable. What's the problem, really? I could talk about a whole bunch of statistics about African Americans and asthma, but I feel like everybody knows those, so I wanted to hit a little bit closer to home. Water and the California drought. What's it really doing? In September, there were 28 cities in the state of California, or 28 small communities, not cities necessarily, that were listed as being on at risk of running out of water in 60 days or less. They've been cycling on and off the list this entire year. These communities are poor, they're rural, and they're predominantly Latino. So some numbers, some stats, just so we can really hear and feel this. What percentage of water use in California is for personal use, individual homes? Just throw them out. I heard 10%, I heard 20%, I heard 5%, 4%. Someone said it, 4%. So those signs on the freeway that I saw driving, conserve water, we're in a drought. Yeah, well, you're talking to the wrong people. Because how much, considering Don just spoke, how much of water use in California is agricultural? 80%. Yeah, it's true. So if we want to conserve water, we actually have to go to the source. Cows are getting so many gallons of water per day that we're not actually hydrating our farm workers. These communities are running out of water, and these are the people that feed us. Those migrant workers, when it comes to job loss, over 17,000 jobs are going to be lost this year in farm working. And considering the fact that a farm worker makes a little over $19,000 a year in a good year, in a good year, that's saying something. $2.2 billion worth of losses this year. 
in the state of California in our agricultural system because of this drought. So this is serious. And for me, that's one of the best examples of the intersection of the environment, the economy, social justice, and people of color. Usually we're the ones, when, when, I, when Green for All talks about people of color being hit first and worst by our environmental crises, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about migrant workers, immigrants, undocumented people who are already having multiple miscarriages, who are already suffering from all kind of health impacts because of the conditions that they work in, who are losing their $19,000 a year paycheck because of a drought. So what do we do about this? How do we fix this? What does it look like? One of the things to me about leadership is personal responsibility. You take responsibility for yourself and the things you do, and you always start with, what could I have done better? What can I do? And it's about recognizing the spectrum of breakdown to breakthrough. Many of us who live in privilege are in breakthrough the majority of the time. We don't worry about where our next meal is going to come from. We don't worry about how we're going to pay rent. And then there's many, many, many people in this country and across the world who live in breakdown, constantly live in breakdown. What does living in the breakdown look like? There was a, a documentary made called, ooh, and it just escaped me. I think it was Unequal Causes, How Inequality is Making Us Sick. If unequal causes is not the first part of it, just come, after me after, come up to me afterward and I'll make sure to get that to you. But the second clause definitely is, is inequality making us sick. It's about the social determinants of health. What this means is that the stress hormone that runs in your body if you're in survival mode and if you're in poverty actually can kill you. And that it's cumulative and that you can get out of the hood at some point, but it still impacts your body. How does that look? What does it look like? Infant mortality rates. An African-American woman with a PhD has a higher infant mortality rate than a white woman with a high school education, statistically. And that's with mass surveys all over the country, just trying to figure out, based upon race alone, what does it look like? How can that be if you're an African-American woman with a PhD? If anyone read that Atlantic article that came out recently, The Case for Reparations, one of the things that that article emphasized is that African Americans, even African Americans that are middle class, are always on the edge. We don't have accumulated wealth. We don't have safety nets. We probably pulled and clawed our way out of the hood and are one generation away from being on welfare, many of us. So when I talk about that cumulative stress effect, my parents did so much they clawed, they clawed their way to make sure that me and my brothers had a good upbringing and that we were raised in a safe neighborhood. And I don't know if my cousin right now is dead or alive, and he has five children with four different women. And so many of my, every single great honor uncle I have has had limbs amputated because of diabetes. Talk about stress. I may appear as an African-American woman that's middle class, but my family is still in it. My entire family is still in it. That's how an African-American woman with a PhD can have a higher infant mortality rate than a white woman with a high school diploma. So if you're living in the breakdown, sometimes you need a little bit of breakthrough to activate. And if you're living in the breakthrough, sometimes you need a little bit of breakdown in order to activate, right? It's important to me that when I come to conferences like this, I do emphasize how bad the problem is because I think it's hard to see it if you're not interacting with it all the time. But I also always want to end with hope, because there is something to be done about this. I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning if I didn't believe there was something that we could do about this. So for me, it's the mixing of a little bit of breakthrough when someone's in breakdown, and a little bit of the breakdown when someone's in breakthrough that leads to this beautiful marriage between implementation and inspiration that can actually help us. And if we all take personal responsibility and make sure that we are leading where we can and that we are following where we should, we can actually do something about this. 
I wanted to end with talking a bit about Green for All and our work over the course of this year because I feel like that, I'm really proud of what Green for All's done this year. It, we really tried to go for the mixture of implementation and inspiration. And so the examples to me are some of what it actually takes. And there's a bunch of other organizations that we collaborated with, which I'll share. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with Green for All, our mission is to build a green economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. Over the years, we've done policy work, we've done research, we've done infrastructure work, we've done movement building communications, right? So this year, we were really, really focused on the EPA carbon emission standards. We knew that people were going to come out really heavily and argue that these emission standards are going to kill jobs, they're terrible, ah, we hate them. So we wanted to come out the gates and say, actually, they're great. And more importantly, people of color who are going to try to be scooped up by people who are not for the environment care about this stuff. So we did a national poll in July. 400 African Americans, 400 Latinos, 100 Asians in battleground states to see what people of color actually think about climate change and the carbon emission standards in this country. There wasn't any recent data and there wasn't any data that actually mixed people of color together. It was just per race. So what we found is that over 70% of people of color in this country in battleground states who are likely voters actively seek climate change news. Not just get it occasionally, but actively seek climate change news. Between 60 and 70% of people of color in this country will vote differently for an electoral candidate based upon their position on climate change. If they go wrong on that issue, they will actually vote for someone else. That was pretty profound. When it comes to the issues that we care about as people of color in this country, first, rising energy costs. Second, gas. Makes sense, filling up my tank. Third was health. So a lot of people think that the health message actually resonates more than the energy message. It doesn't. And finally, when it comes to the carbon emission standards in the economy, how do we feel that the carbon emission standards are going to impact us? We had a question that said, the carbon emission standards are going to impact us negatively and they're going to cost us jobs and they're going to be very expensive. 50% of people responded that they thought that was true. We had a question that said, in the long term, carbon emission standards are going to create many jobs and it's going to be better for the environment and not cost us anything. 75% of people said yes. So what we took from that is that people actually have a complex understanding of this. Short-term loss for long-term gain. That was really important for me. We're not stupid. People of color in this country are actually the most enthusiastic people about the environment and we understand economic complexity. We're ready to go. That for me is hopeful. And then we also submitted a report to the Center for Environmental Quality for the President's Resiliency Task Force this year. For those who don't know what the task force is, there's a, a, a group of 26 mayors that the President convened from all over the country that were supposed to submit recommendations to him earlier this year that are all going to get boiled down into a report that goes to the President's desk in January and then he's going to make recommendations for resiliency that the different departments need to spend money on, climate resiliency specifically. So of the 26 mayors, two are African American, and New Orleans and New York are surprisingly not represented because their mayors are actually dealing with climate resiliency disasters, right? So Green for All went and we did roundtables in New Orleans, New York, and a few other cities to gather recommendations directly from people on the ground, and we submitted our own report, which you can find on our website. But one thing that came up when we were doing that research was that people really care about social capital. And that when you're looking at what an effective environmental resiliency strategy is, business actually surprisingly took a head seat. So Airbnb. Who knows the Airbnb Sandy story? Do people kind of ish? Okay. So during Hurricane Sandy, hosts, Airbnb hosts in New York City started listing their homes for zero dollars to house refugees. Because if you are in a storm, you will be placed in a motel with a voucher that may be in, you know, Egypt, as far as you're concerned. You don't know the grocery stores, you don't know the laundromats, you don't know anything in that neighborhood, and it's incredibly destabilizing because you're so close to home, but not. That can sometimes be more destabilizing than anything. So Airbnb host said, hey, 
I live down the street from you. Why don't you come stay with me? I'm right outside of the storm zone. Airbnb saw this happening, and in 24 hours, they created a new interface on their website that activates in times of disaster so that Airbnb hosts can house refugees from their own neighborhood. And this has been so effective that FEMA has gone to them to house emergency responders, that it's actually becoming an infrastructure piece that is being integrated into the government. And for me, that is a demonstration of how good economics, good economic practices, can really impact the environment and be specifically helpful for people of color. I talked a bit about inspiration in the beginning as well. How do you mix inspiration with implementation in a way that's actually grounding for people, that allows people to participate in the democratic process instead of just holding a sign? We did a summer tour because we knew that we could go around and give a bunch of speeches about the carbon emission standards, but speeches can be boring. And when I went to those hearings, would I have invited a single black mother who was going to take a day off work to go to that? Probably not. It was totally inaccessible. A lot of the people looked like they didn't even want to be there. It was in a room that wasn't very well lit and had that kind of nasty fluorescent flickering lighting. It's just, it, no, there was nothing inviting about it. <laughs> so we wanted to give people an introduction to policy and politics that would be engaging and inviting. We went to five different cities over the course of the spring, summer, and fall. I went to the one in Denver. It was the Juneteenth Festival in Denver that's put on by an African-American run organization there. And Les Nubian performed right after I talked about carbon emission standards and got everybody riled up. And we collected more comment cards for the EPA at that event than we could have had we tabled at a fair or something. Because people actually listened. I spoke for five minutes, and usually that's about all people absorb anyway. So why not make it count? And then we did a round table afterward with the people that were really interested, put their comments and their thoughts into a report that went to the Center for Environmental Quality. We made sure people were participating. And the last example that I want to give is of the People's Climate March. Did anyone here go to the People's Climate March? Yay! So the People's Climate March was in friggin' incredible. They were shooting for 100,000 people, 310,000 people showed up. Right? When it comes to participating and influencing policy, Ban Ki-moon and the heads of state and whatnot in Yahoo were meeting over there, and they in 2015 will be voting on global carbon emission standards, so let's cross our fingers, they got the message. But the People's Climate Watch was to get into the streets right before they met and to show an outpouring of support here and all over the world in parallel marches that happened in different cities across the globe. Right. 310,000 people. And my personal experience being there is that they really didn't want to do a rally afterward. So there weren't any speeches. There weren't any huge stages set up where talking heads made sure to raise money and leverage all of these people that were there. There was a gent We marched, and then we gently dispersed. And the tone and the vibe of the march was that 350.org and the other backbone organizations made absolutely sure that people of color were at the front of that march. Absolutely sure. And I mean, they were serious about it. They had people directing, yes, indigenous peoples over here, allies over here. Like, they had the messaging. They made sure that everybody felt held well so it just didn't feel like white folks were being tossed to the back of the bus because we don't want anyone to feel like they're being tossed to the back of the bus. But we do want to emphasize that allies being behind those who are most affected and pushing us up is actually a very effective way to make sure that vulnerable communities and equity is placed at the center of these things. I marched with my parents and my husband right behind the Aztec dancers. And it was incredible. And the Aztec dancers were right in front of the Meatless Monday folk. And I'm sure the Meatless Monday folk have never really interacted with Aztec dancers. I'm just going to hazard a guess, especially not at an environmental gathering, right? So the different types of people and then right next to the EJ people, the environmental justice people, there's Leonardo DiCaprio and Edward Norton and uh, what's his name? The Hulk. Mark Ruffalo, right? They're just standing there in a trio right in front of the environmental justice people at some point, and I'm sure they have never really interacted before. And then you had Sting hella hiding out in the corner, acting like he was trying to see Leonardo DiCaprio, but really just hiding in the crowd, because if he was by himself, people would realize it was him. 
So you had celebrities, you had indigenous people, you had people of color, you had immigrants and international people, you had white college students, you had everyone doing a demonstration during the time that our world leaders are deciding the fate of our lungs and our air and our oceans. Beautiful. We need more of that. We need more of that. So I'll close by saying that when I talk about personal responsibility, I really mean it. It's all of our responsibility. We all have a role. We all have a thing to do. Find it. Let's do it. Thank you.